Well, good morning, saints. I'm glad you're gathered. Uh, we're in house sessions again this week. Um, so just really invite you to enjoy one another's fellowship and have good conversation and a good time together. Uh, next week, we'll be at Pastors Jeremiah and Susie Jennings house. And so we just invite you to come to gather with that. We'll all be together. And so be praying for great weather. That'll be helpful. Well, today I have, I want to share with you a message titled The First and Second Resurrection. Um, I have found in my studies in the book of Revelation that this message has significant meaning for me. <clears throat> I've come to discover that uh, there's a synergy in the New Testament scriptures, and we could include the Old Testament scriptures as well that really point to the second coming of Jesus and how the saints are to prepare themselves for that glorious time. And that everything that we're about is really about preparing ourselves to be in position, to be worthy at his coming. And so I want to talk about that a little bit today because I really believe it has significant impact on how we live our lives and why we live our lives. I'm going to go through more in a conversation form. I have 16 pages of notes, so I can defend what I'm saying. I just don't have the time to do that. So I'm going to present it more as um, kind of a way to think. And then when we're done, I'm going to invite you to discuss this a little bit with one another. But I want to begin with a scripture that's been in your notes almost every week, and it's found in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 39, where Jesus was saying to really the Pharisees and the leaders, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. We're never to divorce the scriptures or doctrines from the person of Jesus. We're to follow him. We're not to follow doctrine, though we need to, but following him includes doctrine. We're not to follow just uh, snippets of the word or proof texting our, our own dogma. We're to follow the person of Jesus. He reveals himself to us. The book of Revelation is a revelation of who he is. And it's interesting that we treat it more of an end time prophecy than we do an epistle written to his church. I'll give another thought of that in just a moment. But um, what I have found is the more I study the scriptures, the more integral its message appears. I've come to be convinced that John's revelation that we read in the book of Revelation was known by Paul, Peter, Jude, James, all the New Testament epistle writers, and that they knew it prior to John's releasing this, because, of course, they were all had gone to be with the Lord at that time. Because, and I believe this because they all speak in the same direction with the same summons. Jesus is saying, don't just believe in me, walk with me. And that that is really our high calling. In fact, as I read this, part of me wishes the book of Revelation was not at the end of the Bible. So it would be read more as an epistle loaded with relevant doctrine rather than a mystical prediction of the end times. If I were to interview or poll most Christians, I suspect most of them don't read the book of Revelation. If they read the Bible at all, they would have their favorite verses, but the book of Revelation would be pushed aside. So when we look around and we see that maybe I need to read the book of Revelation, I should go read it to find out what's going on. When in fact, it is a call to recognize who Jesus is, to worship him, and then to prepare as we would walk with him. The book of Revelation begins with uh, Jesus saying that this is a revelation, or John says of Jesus, this is a revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And as I said before, when they begin to take place, they'll take place quickly. I got a list of bullet points and to identify what did John see and hear? Well, here's a quick list. He saw the majesty of the slain, sinless lamb exalted to absolute lordship. 
he hears Jesus summon to his summon his church to walk worthy of their high calling as overcoming disciples. He saw a catastrophic end time crisis taking place in the present age. He sees the spectacular reappearance of the King of Kings in establishing his global kingdom. He tells of, as he sees, the internment of Satan in the abyss. He sees the first resurrection and millennial earth reign of Christ and the overcoming saints. He sees a final insurrection and the conquest of sin and death as well as it its author, Satan. He sees the final resurrection and the white throne judgment. And then at the end, he sees and hears it declared the new heaven and new earth. He includes in the beginning of his book that blessed are those who read and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. And I think I put emphasis today on the word keep, that we would hear and keep what he says. All right. Well, the book of Revelation begins with the revealing of Jesus glorified, possessing all authority and poised to release his benevolent and purging rule over the earth. So this is all a good thing. And he is calling to and looking for those saints who will rise up and be counted worthy to rule with him. This really is the call of the book of Revelation. Jesus is calling to the saints to rise up and be counted worthy to rule with him. In Philippians 3, verse 14, the Apostle Paul says it this way, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. We'll come back to that in a little bit. The close of the book of Revelation has... Uh, closes with two resurrections that take place. The first resurrection is prior to his millennial reign where Jesus' overcoming disciples are given their new bodies and seated in thrones. The second resurrection is one of the final events preceding the white throne judgment. And the content in between the book of Re- within the book of Revelation is to foster confidence in Jesus' lordship as we prepare our hearts for our journey to our resurrection. So it isn't an unveiling of things so we can escape. It is, it is news before it happens so we can prepare our hearts to walk worthy of the Lord and glorify him in the midst of the unfolding of the revelation of Jesus Christ as he takes possession of the earth. Now, I'm again, I, I said I have a lot of notes, and I do. And I have a lot more I can say about this, but I just want you to capture the heart of what, what is to be said here. Okay? And then uh, we'll, we can talk more about it at another time. In Revelation 20, we come to read John's words where he says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he lay hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. So, the same personality is the dragon, the serpent of old, the devil and Satan. And bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And uh, there's a reason to that. Won't be able to get into it this morning, but it's a worthy subject as well. He continues and says, I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. John continues speaking a little bit, and then we're going to jump down to Verse 11, 
And he says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, I have had a, a kind of an interesting journey where before I got to the, my study of the book of Revelation, as I was reading the epistles, I keep finding in Peter wrestling with his call to the saints to persevere and, and be triumphant and honor the Lord. I find the apostle Paul uh, speaking similar things where, and we'll read it, where he pressed forward and he counted everything he had done in the flesh as nothing that he might gain Christ. And uh, James talking about living out your Christianity in a very tangible way so people can see it. And, and I find that what they had in common was this yearning and pressing forward to find that, to, to be found in Christ, um, mature and and holy and prepared, they were st striving in the good sense of the word for pleasing the Lord and and arriving at a place that was different than when they started in their walk with the Lord. I know that there's a lot of teachings about who we are in Christ, and that's all, and it's appropriate because when we come to the Lord, we are given a position. We are transported, translated, transferred into a position of authority as a believer. I have that place. And that there are blessings that are available to me. I don't need to strive for them. I don't need to earn them. I can receive them by faith. And God takes good pleasure in, in me growing in my understanding of that and and entering into the fullness that he has. But there is a strong message that runs throughout the New Testament that also invites every believer to find their walk with Christ that brings a development of maturity within them that makes them Christ-like, not just positionally, but in reality, in, in everyday natural and spiritual reality where we are like Christ and that we are conformed into his image. So there's the starting place of inheritance and position and then there is the journey and the, the commitment of our journey determines the, the arrival of our final Christ-likeness, so to speak. It's, it's interesting. I mean, there's a lot of New Testament writing to articulate this. So to summarize it in just a few moments, couldn't do it justice. I say all that to say, this is why I've come to, to believe that there are two resurrections at the in Revelation chapter 20, near the end of the age, that include the saints. And that there are two categories of saints, so to, so to speak. One category is the overcomers that Jesus writes about in the first couple of chap chapter two and three when he writes the letters to the churches. And then what we would say are the non-victorious saints who are believers but have never entered into the walk. And therefore, they have a different resurrection that takes place. Just stay with me for a little bit. Let me give us, a, for instance, when we talk when we look at the church in Sardis, for an example, here's a Christian church that had a reputation among believers for being alive. Therefore, it was growing a vital congregation or at least a group of congregations. It is likely the church of Sardis was made up of many believers in Christ who undoubtedly, um, as it was undoubtedly true for the other churches as well. But I want you to picture a growing church that is 
is pleased with its progress and its addition of believers that are going on. But let's look at what Christ said concerning the church at Sardis. He said in Revelation 3, 4, You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So he is saying, there's a few of you who are worthy to walk with me in white. Would that imply that most of you are not? Now, what I want to propose is he is not saying then that only the overcomers are going to be with me in heaven. I don't think that that's what he's saying. I think the invitation is only the overcomers are going to walk with me in white that are going to have on the robes of authority to where they will rule and reign with me. The others, they'll be resurrected into paradise, but, but they won't be in the first resurrection, which will be those who will take thrones and rule and reign with Jesus. So I think the inference is, cl is clear there that the majority of Christians in Sardis did not fit the category that Jesus was summoning them to. So, those who attain the first resurrection from the dead, the blessed and holy royal priesthood of God, most assuredly are the ones that are found worthy to walk with Christ and to wear the white robes of what I will believe would be priesthood. So, if um, it appears that the majority of Christians in Sardis do not qualify for the first resurrection from the dead, according to what is written, could it be implied that the Apostle Paul had some sort of sense of this as well? And I want to read out of Philippians 3, where, 7 through 14, where the Apostle Paul alluded to this as well. Where he says, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I am suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means... I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And then he says, Not that I have already attained, or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now we know that the Apostle Paul had secured his salvation by faith through Jesus Christ. He was an apostle of Jesus Christ he was a new believer, a new creation. He had been born again. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was all these things, yet he, he himself said that he had not, he didn't cl claim to have already attained to the resurrection from the dead. So what was he referring to? I believe he was referring to the first resurrection that is highlighted by John in Revelation chapter 20. The resurrection of the overcoming saints who will be raised to sit in thrones to rule and reign with Christ. Salvation is free. Earning a place in the throne, though, is something we do by walking in obedience and in faithfulness to our Savior. You could say it this way, perhaps. Salvation comes by declaring correct doctrine. Ruling and reigning him comes by walking with him. So we need both. We need the doctrine to put us on track, and then we need the fellowship with Jesus to arrive where he would have us. This inspires me because it gives meaning to my life. It gives purpose to who I am as a Christian. 
I no longer am just saved and waiting for heaven. I am, in fact, working even now for, for Jesus' redemptive work to be taking foothold in the earth. I'm already working toward that. And to the degree that I am faithful with what he's entrusted to me will be the measure he will use to promote me at the end of the age. And interestingly enough, a consideration might be, what are the thrones that he's talking about in Revelation 20? Could it be the ones that are presently occupied by spiritual wickedness that are wreaking havoc over the earth and that the book of Revelation demonstrates that God, Jesus himself, authorized by God and empowered by all of heaven, is going to purge those thrones from the evil darkness and press darkness completely out of the planet and then replace them with believers who are trustworthy to make decisions based on the love of God working in their hearts. And that what a, what a reversal it will be when the earth now has the sons of God seated in thrones. All creation will rejoice because life will come back to the planet and all will be well. And God is looking for those who will work with him. Now, the reason I want to suggest that there are two groups of believers who are, res are resurrected in the end times is we, we also read, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 3.15, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So this is talking about a person who really doesn't live their lives to honor God or in obedience to God may lose everything they did and claim that it was for God, but they themselves will be saved. Also, in 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, when there was a man who was misbehaving in the church, Paul admonished the church to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So I think we can see from here that it's not just victorious saints that are saved, there are the ones that uh, arrive at the first resurrection, but also at the conclusion, the second resurrection, there will be saints who will be resurrected into their bodies at that time, and that they will also be judged, their works will be judged, and that they will be positioned and placed based on their works. There will also be, and I'll just kind of jump to it, at that later resurrection, it, it says, and if I look up that verse, uh, let me just bring it back. It says, um, the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the book. So we have books and then we have the book of life. Believers are in the book of life. And then there's just books, books that, that people have on their lives. And so I'm picturing several things taking place at the last resurrection. We have believers who have been in paradise. They just haven't been enthroned in the earth. But they've been in heaven. They've been having a great time. They've been saved. And they're loving it. Well, they don't... I guess I'm picturing that they haven't gotten their resurrected bodies. Therefore, they haven't come to the earth to make things right. They aren't a part of the workforce of laborers and priests and kings that Jesus is uh, installing to bring life back but they are going to come to the earth and they'll their works will be judged and then their bodies will be given to them and they'll come to the earth there'll be another group which i see is this sea of humanity which are people outside the faith perhaps uh, people in chile two thousand years ago who never had the gospel but they lived according to their conscience they looked at creation and governed their lives such that they will be measured based on what they knew. And then they will also at that time be resurrected, some to everlasting death, but some to eternal life. And then death and Hades is going to give up their dead and that they will be judged and then they will be banished to the lake of fire. And so we have these particular groups of people that are mentioned in Revelation 20. We have groups of people who are resurrected into different resurrections. The wicked will be raised up, judged. They won't be given redeemed bodies, in my understanding, because they won't need them. They'll just be cast into the lake of fire. Then there will be some out of the sea who God judges them worthy. 
and they will be clothed and be able to continue on. And then there will be the saints too as well. And um, two resurrections. First one for victorious saints. The second for the rest of the saints. And then as well as the wicked. Okay. Then um, let me just add up. I wanted to bring up the idea that um, when it comes to our salvation, Jesus didn't state that we must just simply believe in him. His point was that because of our belief in him, we would do what he taught. It's not just believe that he historically lived, but that we believe and then we can trust that the things he say to us, we can believe and obey. Um, it was never the intention of Jesus that our belief in him should be an abstract faith or, or an alternative to faithful obedience to his commands. That we were to really take salvation from four steps to being saved to entering into a relationship where we walk with the Savior every day. The judgment of the last days in my estimation, is not based on the fact that people were bound by sin. We were all born into sin. In fact, the final, at the resurrection of the body, we cast off all sinfulness and we put on eternal life and immortality. So it isn't really until that time that we are actually free from sin and its nature working in our members. What we're really uh, called to is, if, if we're judged according to our works, the basement will be, how did we live our lives in the light that he had given us to live our lives? Did we obey as he spoke in our hearts or he moved in our conscience? Were we a person of integrity? Did we put God first? Did we live for him and for his glory? Were we serving him? Were we seeing him in others and serving him in the lives of others? If we had the chance to hear the gospel, do we obey what we hear? Are we good stewards of what he imparts to us? Do we waste our talents on self-promotion or self-gratification? Or do we use our talents to serve the kingdom? Do we take up our cross and follow the Lord? Are we diligent with what he's entrusted to us? Do we waste our life on unprofitable things? Do we neglect our salvation where it's even stated that we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling? So God isn't condemning us based on sin. He's, con he's judging our works based on stewardship. That's what he's looking for. And he rewards faithful stewardship. And so I'm probably running out of time here. And so I think I'll wrap up with the couple of thoughts. <clears throat> he who attains to the first resurrection are those who are overcomers as listed in the seven letters to the churches. There is a distinction between the overcomer and then the non-overcoming saint. The overcoming saint is giving all sorts of promises. Promises that, uh, that the second death won't hurt them, that they'll be clothed in a new garment, that they'll have a stone with their name written on it, that glorious things will happen. And I can't share them with you now, but I have a list of every promise that was given to the overcomer and where that fits in the end of the book of revelation there'll be a pillar in the temple of god they'll be they'll have a they'll they'll have a their name written and we see names written in the temple of god in the end of the book of revelation that these are all promises for them and that the people of the first resurrection in a real sense forego the scrutiny of the judgment of their works because they have been categorically deemed um, fully invested into the things of God and that they are awarded. Those who don't then face the trials and struggles of the, the second resurrection and the white throne judgment where things will be scrutinized. I put that out there for your consideration. Um, I have a lot more to say about it and maybe I'll need to. And uh, I would love it if you have questions. Um, go ahead and... and uh, email Jay or Susie. <laughs> you can just email me at uh, Tim at chapelvalley.org. Um, again, there's, I think the heart of, of the end of the book of Revelation needs to be in sync with the beginning 
of the heart of the book of Revelation, the letter to the churches. It is a summons for us to be overcomers. So what we could talk about right now, is this new to you? Is this outside of your of the letter of your doctrine? Do you see the Apostle Paul striving for more? Is there a difference between someone like the Apostle Paul and the man who was sleeping with his father's wife in with in the Corinthian church where Paul said, turn his body over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit might be saved. Is there a difference in these two individuals in the end when the Lord returns? Is there a difference? When Jesus says at the end that he is coming and he's coming soon and he has, he says, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. What does that mean to you? What should that mean to us? These are questions that we can talk about. And I'm going to invite you just to take a few moments to just engage in some conversation. And maybe those who are hosting the homes can stimulate the conversation. Um, again, there's no reason to fear. We are summons to just get focused. And this is the hour to do that. I'm going to pray for you real quick. Lord Jesus, you are worthy to summon us to walk worthy of you. And we're delighted that you don't take pleasure in ruling and reigning as a sole individual and an overlord, but you delight in raising up a people who at once, at one time, we walked in darkness, were alienated from you and didn't know you and maybe even cursed you. To become your people who can sit with you in heaven's thrones, and rule and reign with you and, and, and lead and serve just like you would. That you would entrust to us such a glorious future if we will allow your work to work deeply in us. And Lord, I know that you know that we can't overcome sin in, our, in and of ourselves. We can't deliver ourselves. We can't pull ourselves up by the, our own bootstraps and somehow... Uh, through ambition and determination and zeal, end up where we want to be. All we can do is say, Lord, we hear you knocking. We open to you. Come and work in us the work of Christ's likeness so we can be all that we need to be. We press forward to yield to you your workmanship within us so that we can honor you and glorify you. And we commit ourselves to you and thank you for the blessed hope that is before us of the resurrection. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Enjoy your fellowship and conversation time.